The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. Going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour would pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came back and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Indeed, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went off and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping. For their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Third time, he came and said, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinful men. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. Father, we believe that all Holy Scripture is written for our learning, and so we pray by your Holy Spirit that we would so hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest this, your Holy Word, that we would be changed by it more and more to be like Jesus for the sake of the world. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Have you been sleeping while you should have been praying? I'm not talking about right now, this morning. (laughs) Have you been sleeping while you were supposed to be praying? Of course you have been, and so have I. Have you been unfaithful when you were supposed to be faithful? Of course you have been, and so have I. Have you been disobedient when you should have been obedient to the Lord. Of course you have, and so have I. But fear not because of Gethsemane. As we walk through these last few hours leading up to the death of the Son of God, through this Lenten season, we come now to Gethsemane and we find hope for those who sleep when they're supposed to be praying. Hope for those who are disobedient when they're supposed to be obedient. Hope for those who have been unfaithful when they are supposed to be faithful. For here's what we see in Gethsemane. We see the man of sorrows submit himself fully to the Father. But here's what's amazing. In Gethsemane, we see the son of the, the man of sorrows submit himself fully to the Father for the sake of those who sleep in that garden. He does it for those who are sleeping when they should have been praying. He does it for those who are unfaithful when they should have been faithful. He does it for those who were disobedient when they should have been obedient. He does this, the son of man, the man of sorrows, submitting to the father for those of us who sleep. See, first of all, we recognize that in the garden of Gethsemane, he is the man of sorrows. Verse 33, if you're with me in Mark chapter 14, beginning of verse 32, we find Gethsemane in Mark's version. Verse 33, as he takes Peter and James and John with him, it says, he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. These are not small words in the Greek. It means nothing less than he was facing 
the terrors of what was before him. He was entering into the horror of the moment. He was having a deep, visceral response to what was before him. And then in verse 34, he explains his inner life when he says to the disciples, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. I am so torn up and terrified by what is coming that I feel like I'm going to die because he is about to die. Now, I know it sounds a little strange for some of us for me to suggest that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was afraid of what was coming, but that's exactly what the text says. Now, if your Jesus wasn't afraid, if your version of Jesus kind of walked into the garden, kind of like that Anglo-Saxon version that was written, I think, in the 14th or 13th century of, you know, the, 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 this idea of Jesus kind of walking in the garden going, all right, I'm like Iron Man or Thor, and I'm just ready to die. That is not a biblical version of what we see in Scripture. Jesus was terrified in this moment facing his death. If your Jesus isn't afraid at his death, then your Jesus, I'm afraid, has not carried your death for you. Because if he has not entered fully in to real human death, then how can he save us from ours? As Gregory of Nazianzus says, that which he does not assume or take up, he cannot heal. He must enter into the fullness of the human experience in order to heal the fullness of the human experience. This is real death. The church struggled for this for the first 500 years. There was debates back and forth. You'd read a text like Gethsemane and say, okay, is he God or is he man? And the church, after 500 years of debate, could finally say to the answer, is Jesus God or is Jesus man? The church would say, yes, well catechized, praise the Lord. Yes, fully God, fully man. What we describe as the two natures of Jesus, the two natures of Christ, that together, unified in Jesus incarnate, the Son of God become flesh, is both divinity and humanity. And therefore, the death that he suffers is a full, real, complete human death and everything goes with it. It's not just the moment that his nails go into his hands on the cross, but it is all the terror that comes up to that moment. He enters into all of it. This is what Jesus is facing in Gethsemane. I mean, look at what verse 36 says. As he goes off and prays, what does he say to the Father? I know this is going to throw some of you. He says, remove this cup from me. What's the cup? The cup is the cup of wrath that he's about to drink on behalf of humanity, that he's about to take your sin and mine and every sinner that walks this earth ever has been and ever will in his own body on the cross. He'll bear the punishment. It's the cup of wrath that comes to him. He pays it for us. And he says in Gethsemane, Abba, Father, remove this cup from me. Jesus said, Father, take the cross from me. And again, you may say, that's not my Jesus. My Jesus marched in there. Did he? What kind of death was he facing? There's no play acting here. There's no pretending. Jesus has fully entered in what it is to be humanity. And therefore, in the face of this horrifying death, yes, he is afraid and says, Father, Remove it from me. But then, of course, what does he say next? That's going to be my second point. But for now, just so we're clear, he says, yet not what I will, but what you will. John Calvin, I think, brilliantly says of this, it is not sin for Jesus in Gethsemane to ask for the cup to be taken from him. It is honesty. He is having an honest response to the gravity of what's really happening in that moment. He's saying, in the words of Calvin, Dad, I don't want to do this, but I will do it if it's your will. This is what it means for the Son of God to have taken on flesh. Two natures. As we say in the creed every week, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and he suffered 
for us, fully entered in to our suffering. You know, within iconography, within the Eastern church, some of you know, have icons in your home. It's a funny thing now, in the last sort of 50 years, folks in the Western church are suddenly bringing icons into their homes. I mean, 50 years ago, no one in the Western church would have been bringing icons in their home. You know these icons, right, from the Eastern church, two-dimensional, very specific depictions of Jesus or the saints, and every one of those pieces within an icon, as the icon is being prayerfully written, it's all to indicate aspects of the gospel, what the individual's wearing, what color it is, and even the position of their hands. There's one thing interesting, when you look at Jesus often in these icons, or St. Paul, or one of the saints, notice his hands and the position of his fingers when he blesses. It's a very specific thing. Actually, bishops now, you can see the, the, the reunification of the East and West is happening in practice. I've been told several times that I'm doing the blessing wrong now. Uh, now that I'm a bishop, I've had several bishops correct me. I'm a baby bishop. They're you know, correcting me along the way. And, and I'm supposed to put my hands in the same way that you see on the icons. Bishops are supposed to do this. You, you take your, your, your bottom two, I'm not very dexterous, you take the bottom two and, and the thumb, three persons, one God, and then the two fingers straight up. Three persons, one God, and then the two natures of Jesus, fully God and fully man. It stands in icons for 2,000 years. Why? Why every time we look at Jesus in these icons, when we look at St. Paul, when we look at St. Peter, who's in this story today, and they have their hands up in blessing. Why this? Because it's declaring the very center of the gospel. That unless Jesus fully enters into not just his divine nature, but his human nature, we are lost. But because he has fully entered into our humanity, he has come to rescue us from our broken humanity. It's interesting when you look at this idea of the man of sorrows, that language comes from Isaiah 53, a prophecy about Jesus. Isaiah 53, verse three says, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He bore our sorrows. He bore our infirmities. He bore our griefs. That was the promise. The language here of Jesus in the garden is nothing less an absolute discouragement, yes, even depression, absolute despair. Have you been there? So has your God, and he does it for you and for me. The man of sorrows, fully entering in to a human death, But he submits. That's our second point. Look at verse 36. He says, yet not what I will, but what you will. Now this suddenly in comparison with the first becomes profound. If Jesus is fully entering into a human death, if he's fully living into the fear and the terror of this, to say to the Father, but if it's your will makes us stand in absolute amazement. But if this is your will, Father, I will do it. He submits to the Father. And here's what's amazing about Jesus' submission to the Father. Again, the fact that he's entered into fully human nature. Jesus has taken on a human will. What that means is that Jesus' obedience, when you look at Jesus living out his life in obedience before the Father, and he does that all the time. I mean, every, everywhere you look in the Gospels, Jesus is talking about his Father. He's obedient to his Father. He loves his Father. He finds his identity in his Father. He's always running off to pray quietly to his Father, right? It's all about the Father. It gets him in trouble. John 5, right? They're, they're ready to stone him in John 5 because he's doing this audacious thing, calling God his Father. 
Jesus' whole life under the Father and being obedient to the Father is not something that just happened automatically because if Jesus truly had a fully human will, in the language of Hebrews 5, he learned obedience. He didn't just do obedience, he learned it. Can you imagine what this means for us? That a truly fully human being has come who learned how to be fully obedient before God. He learned it. He practiced it. I think the way we most commonly see him practicing his obedience, how he learned obedience was in his prayer life. The disciples were always amazed by Jesus' prayer life. I mean, he was always running off and talking to the Father early in the morning. The crowds would be gathering. They'd think, all right, now we're getting some traction here. And then Jesus would vanish for early morning prayer time with the Father. And they'd say, what are you doing? There's no time for prayer. we got things to do. Jesus was always living in to a prayer life with the Father, listening, obeying. So much so that the disciples watched him long enough and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And when they say teach us to pray, they don't just mean give us the words. They're saying teach us to pray the way you pray. Because we can tell that your prayer life is really the center of who you are. You know, Tim Keller says these words about Jesus' prayer life, how central his prayer life was to his obedience, to living this obedient life before God, sort of learning this obedience through day-to-day habits. That Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He, Keller says, he healed people with prayer. He insisted that some demons could only be cast out by prayer. He prayed often and regularly with fervent cries and tears and sometimes prayed all night. The Holy Spirit came upon him and anointed him when he was praying. He was transfigured with the divine glory as he prayed. When he faced his greatest crisis in the Garden of Gethsemane, he did so with prayer. And finally, he died praying. Now, Peter on the other hand, is not quite a prayer warrior yet, is he? Peter isn't quite there. And it shows in his obedience. See, if Jesus had a human will, and by the way, isn't it neat, just as a side note, that Jesus takes the same three disciples with him when he goes to transfiguration and when he goes to Gethsemane. Don't think for a minute he wasn't intentionally trying to teach the two natures right there. The three, Peter, James, and John, Mark 9, verse 2, he took them alone and was transfigured before him. Ah, the divine nature beheld. And then the next time he takes Peter, James, and John, he was greatly discouraged and troubled and sorrowful unto death. His humanity. He shows that same two group both natures. And as he took on a human will and learned obedience, what it means for you and I, can you hear it this morning, that our human wills can also be learning obedience. That through him and his work and his spirit and his example, that we can begin like him, our elder brother, to learn obedience as we adopt practices, listening, seeking to obey day by day. Peter is not yet much of a prayer warrior. He's sleeping and his lack of prayer affects his obedience. You will notice that it's three times that Jesus comes and finds them sleeping. And in a moment, three times Peter's going to deny him. It seems to say in the gospel text that Jesus' three denials were preceded by his three naps. We learn obedience through the small, ordinary, daily habits of living into our prayer, prayer life. You know, one of my heroes right now, my new heroes, as many of you have heard me talk about it before, is Archbishop Henry Orambi. He's the retired Archbishop of Uganda, and I get to work with him now in some of my responsibilities. And what I love about Archbishop Orambi is not only was he so faithful in his active ministry, but now in retirement, he's still faithful. 
And this is just what's sad because so often we see leaders not end well. We see them do well in active ministry and then they don't end well at the end. Orambi is faithful at the end. And so I asked him, I said, how do you do this? How do you, how do you live into faithfulness? And with no pride and no pretension, he just said, wherever I am in the world in whatever time zone, at 10 p.m. I go to bed and at 4 a.m. I rise to pray. And I said, could you do like 11 and five or maybe midnight and six? And he said, Paul, 10 and four and pray. Again, no pride, no pretense. It's just fact. He has lived and enculturated a habit of prayer. And we should not be surprised that he's learned obedience through it, just like his master, just like his Lord. What does Jesus say? When they say, teach us to pray, he says, pray like this. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We learn to submit to his will as we practice it with daily prayer life. You see in Gethsemane, the man of sorrows fully entering into humanity, fully submits to the father's will for us. And that's the third point. He does it for those who sleep. Verse 41, Jesus comes a third time. Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. They're sleeping when they should have been faithful. And yet salvation still comes. You know, I I took a bunch of you to a hockey game uh, a month ago. My first act as a bishop, let's go go to a hockey game. It was was very appropriate. You're all becoming much holier through this experience. 320 of us going out, and we had to explain the game of hockey. And one of the things in hockey is, you know, you score the goal, you get a point. But in hockey, if you've helped set up the goal, you also get a point for an assist. The two last players that touch the puck on your team get assists because they're helping you. They're helping make it happen. You know, they set up the play and then you scored. There is no assists in the kingdom of God when it comes to our salvation. That's the point. We're sleeping while it all gets decided. Humanity's dead in the tomb when this becomes a reality. We do not contribute to our salvation. We do not assist our salvation. We have got to get rid of this self-help version of Christianity that says God helps those who helps themselves or you got to meet God halfway. We don't need self-help. We need a savior. While we were sleeping, he submitted himself to the father for our salvation. This is the center of the gospel. You know what I find fascinating too? Just think on this for a minute. How did Peter know what Jesus was saying while he was praying to the Father? I mean, how do we get this accurate account? Some people said, oh, see, that's why it's not true. No, here's why it's true. As we know by tradition that Mark's gospel is the record of Peter's preaching. John Mark followed Peter around. And so as Peter preached these stories, Mark wrote them down in what we now call the gospel of Mark. So how did Peter know what Jesus was saying to the Father if they were sleeping the whole time. Here's how they knew. Because after the resurrection, Jesus told them. Acts chapter 1 verse 3 says that for 40 days, Jesus, the resurrected Lord, met with the disciples, met with the apostles, and they talked about many things. Of all the things Jesus told him, all the things he had to explain, can you imagine that moment when Peter said, oh Lord, um, hey, you know that moment in the garden? Remember when we were sleeping? Oh, we were so terrible, Lord. We were sleeping and sleeping. What was actually happening in the garden uh, while we were sleeping, Lord? Can you imagine the moment that Jesus said to Peter, oh Peter, (laughs) as you slept, I lay face down before my father. And I submitted to his will, his cup of wrath for your salvation. This is the heart of what we mean by grace. Unearned, undeserved, unassisted. 
For the words of Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sleepers, while we were yet dead, Christ died for us. So, have you been sleeping while you should be praying? Of course you have, and so have I. Fear not. Have you been faithless when you should have been faithful? Of course you have, and so have I. Fear not. Have you been disobedient when you should have been obedient to the will of the Father? Of course you have, and so have I. Fear not, fear not because of Gethsemane. For the man of sorrows entered fully into our humanity, entered fully into our death, and the man of sorrows submitted himself to the Father's will, and he did it while we were sleeping. And this, my friends, this is the good news. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.